So in the last video, we introduced Darcy's law and the concept of permeability. Now what we're going to do is try and relate permeability to pore size. So let's um, consider a single circular tube, so circle, circular cross-section of radius r, and that comes out of the plane of the board. Now, as I said, we're not doing a fluid dynamics class, but for those of you who have done a fluid dynamics class with a Navier-Stokes equation, it's quite complex and there are not that many analytic solutions. But you can do an analytic solution for a tube, a circular tube. And in fact, it's a solution of the steady state Stokes equation. Um, I'm not going to derive it here, but I'm simply quote the answer. The total flow, so I've given it a capital Q because this will be in cubic meters per second. So it's not like little Q, which the Darcy flux, which was a flow per unit area. This the total flow in the tube is as follows. It's pi r to the fourth over 8 mu grad p. And I ignored any gravitational effects, so I'm going to assume it's just horizontal flow. Okay, there is a, a minus rho g, and, and q here must be a vector if it's a gradient. If I'm just going to define q as just a scalar quantity, then I can write this as pi r to the fourth over 8 mu times a pressure difference over the length of the tube. Now, at this point, sometimes people say, oh, 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 no, we're to the minus sign. So let's, let's be clear about this because sometimes it does cause some problems. Imagine this is pressure and this is length. And zero is where I inject fluid and L is where I produce the fluid. The pressure at zero is here and the pressure at L is here. Flow goes from high to low pressure. Delta P is defined simply to be a positive quantity, so it's PO minus PL. The pressure gradient, right, DP by DX, is PL minus PO over L, which is minus delta P over L. So minus the pressure gradient is plus delta P. So this is this is correct. Don't get yourself into a muddle over minus signs. Delta P, when we write it, is always a positive quantity. And we know, yeah, we have to inject, don't we? So it's a higher pressure at the inlet. Mm -hmm. Right, so don't, uh, don't let it confuse you. Okay, so that's um, a solution to the Navier-Stokes equation. You say, okay, so what? The key thing is not the pi and the eights, but this power four. Now, this is quite interesting and actually requires some explanation. If I imagine that this was a wire, okay, and I had a, a wire and I put a voltage difference across it, and I said, well, how much current flows? We would say, well, the current that's flowing is obviously proportional to the electrical conductance, but it would be proportional to the um, area of the wire. So, for instance, if I doubled the radius of the wire, the area will go up by a factor of four, and the current will go up by a factor of four. It's sort of obvious, isn't it? Hopefully, it's sort of obvious. And the reason why, physically, they've got a voltage difference. The electrons are moving at a specific speed. If I have a fatter wire, they're still moving at the same speed. There's just more of them because greater area. Okay? So most things you might think, yeah, that, that, that sort of makes sense. Yeah, it should, um, you know, the, 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 the total flux should go as area. But it doesn't. This is pi r to the ball. That's the square of the area. Why is that? Well, the reason actually comes from the boundary condition. There's a zero flow at the solid surface. So if I make this a bit more explicit, okay, this is a tube, this is the solid. Now imagine I had a smaller tube, right, because it's easier to draw here. I had a smaller tube like this, okay, say at half the radius. Now if we compare the two, what happens is as I move away from the solid, at the solid I'm assuming a zero velocity, as I go away from the solid, 
the velocity increases. And in fact, that's related essentially to the viscosity. The lower the viscosity, the faster the velocity can increase. So when I get to here, there's the maximum velocity. And in fact, the velocity varies parabolically. So it increases um, um, parabolically with distance, so as, as sort of distance, as distance squared away from the solid. Now let's think about it. Because this is a large di distance, I can get to quite a high velocity in the centre. Here, it's a shorter distance from the solid, so I don't, for the same driving force, don't see such a high velocity. So the reason why there's an area squared is, clearly, this has four times the area of that. So that's going to be four times more flux. But the velocity is also higher here. So that's where the R fourth comes in. And that is going to be super significant because we're going to look at flow and pause media. And the flow within the pore space is hugely, and I mean hugely variable, dependent on size. So it's not just, oh, well, I have slightly bigger pores and that's going to have more flow. It's going to have much, much, much much more flow because it's the fourth power. So that's the first thing I want to think about. The second is now, let's turn this into a porous medium. Now, how do we do that? Well, imagine we have a bundle of tubes, all of radius R. So I'm going to draw this, and I'm not going to draw too many. Yes, this does look like our pores, but I'm going to make it simpler. I'm not going to put throats in. We're not going to have any displacement here. Okay, it's just a bundle of, of tubes. Each tube has a radius R. And the distance between the centers of the tubes, okay, this distance, I'm going to call a distance D. So one way you can think about it, and actually it turns out to be a rather nice way of thinking about it, I can put a box around each tube, okay, and this box is length D and length D. It may not be drawn that nicely, but I, around each tube I can draw this, this box. That's the, between centre and centre, it's the same here, midway, okay? Okay, so imagining a porous medium where we have a bundle of tubes coming out of the plane of the board, and I've got flow, high pressure here, lower pressure, so the, the flow is sort of going out towards you. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to find um, what the flow rate is, but I want to relate this to Darcy's law. I'm actually going to relate it to the permeabilities. How do I do that? Well, let's... Let's write Dulce's law, shall we? So I'm going to write Q, and I'm going to do it in a simplified fashion. It's K over mu, and then there's grad P, and then there's a rho G. I'm going to replace that by a delta P over L. So I'm going to write Q like this, but this is capital Q written in this form. So what I want... I've got Q for a single tube, but Q, little Q, is my capital Q divided by area. Flow per unit area. And this is where, what does area mean? So, if I want to say I've got a tube here, right? so I've got flow in this tube, right? so let's just indicate this tube here. I know that the flow is given by this. But in Darcy's law, I have a flow rate per unit area. What is the area I should use? What's the area? Well, the naive thing people immediately latch onto is they say, oh yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> power squared, isn't it? Ha, area circle, I remembered it. No, 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 no. I said, when we got Darcy's law, we got lots of pores, we got flow. The area is the area of the whole porous medium, not just the little holes. So actually each tube occupies of the porous medium. A porous medium is the entirety of the pores and the solid together. The area is d squared. So Q, little q, is big Q over D squared, not pi R squared. Okay, so we can write that. That's pi R to the fourth over eight D squared mu delta P over L. Okay, so that's that looks fine. And now it's looking very sort of Darcy law-ish, isn't it? But there's one other step, 
Um, because it seems to contradict what I said. I said, well, I don't really want to be sort of, you know, trying to add up too many pores. So let's define porosity. So porosity is a fundamental concept in porous media. Maybe I should have introduced it earlier. Um, porosity is the fraction of the total volume of the porous medium, solid and voids, that is void space. Okay. Now, porosity is given this symbol phi. This is a Greek letter. And for those of you who want to, you know, write it in Microsoft Word, you type F and then you go to symbol font and you get this. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is unfortunately with the uh, Good word processors, people are getting worse and worse, and they're doing all sorts of empty sets or Norwegian O's, or all sorts of odd circular type things with a slash through it. Just get it right. It's a Greek letter, okay? This is science, Greek letter. Okay, so it's given the Greek letter phi, and it is the fraction of the total volume of the pores medium that is void. So imagine we go out one meter here. The total volume of the pores medium for a single tube is D times D times one, so d squared. The volume of the pore space, that pi r squared you wanted to say, is pi r squared times one meter. So the porosity, hopefully this should be relatively straightforward, is pi r squared over d squared. Which means we can write this equation, we can get rid of the pi and the d squared, and an r squared, it's a porosity, so it's pi r squared over 8 mu delta, delta p, sorry, not grad p. Do it with grad p if you're more comfortable with that, but it's normally simpler like this. So now let's compare terms. Right, we've got a k here, a mu delta p over l. So this bit, right, is this bit. So what we've got left, we've got a k here, and we've got a final squared over 8. So let's uh, write it down where we've got a little bit of space. The permeability is phi r squared over 8. And what I say before, the permeability was related to a poor area. That's where the r squared comes in. Now, there is another coefficient. Obviously, lower porosity means there's fewer pores occupying the pore space. So obviously, permeability goes down. If I have half as many tubes, if I take out half of the tubes, I'm going to have half the flow for a given pressure gradient, so that's obviously where porosity comes in. And then there's a numerical coefficient. Now that numerical coefficient for a bundle of tubes, we're all lined up, is 8. Now hopefully it doesn't take too much imagination to realise that real porous media, in very complex pore space, you've got these wide pores and you go into the throats, the restrictions, and it's very tortuous and it's going in all directions, the coefficient's going to be a lot lower, or sorry, the lowest, yes, a lot lower, that is what's on the denominator is going to be a lot higher than just if we have straight tubes, you know, with no blocks. So in reality, the coefficient, just empirically, in reality with real three-dimensional rocks, we have something that's roughly speaking porosity times 10 to the minus 2, so about a hundredth of this, times a typical throat radius, because that's what restricts flux. So now let's make one further analogy. I won't go any further. You've got per permeability here related to a pore size squared. So it's very sensitive to pore size. The flow in a single pore or throat is related to the fourth power because you can move at a larger velocity. And the analogy to that is really traffic. So if you have a motorway, certainly in the UK, most motorways have three lanes. Okay, so um, you have these three lanes in each direction. So an ordinary road is one lane in each direction. So you assume, oh yeah, so a motorway takes um, three times the traffic, you know, three lanes, three times the traffic. Obvious, isn't it? Well, it's obviously not correct, is it? Right, for those of you who know about driving around London, you have the M25, which is three lanes in places, sometimes four lanes in, in many others now. Okay, it doesn't take three or four times the traffic of an ordinary road. It takes much, much, much more than that. Okay. Why is that? Why a motorway actually takes much more than just three little roads? 
is because on a motorway you can drive faster, can't you? Right? If there's a slow car you can overtake, right? You've designed the junction so you're not stopping and no traffic lights or anything like that. So when you make a wider road, it's not just that it is has more lanes, so takes more cars. That's that's true, but the cars are also proceeding faster. So you get this double boost. And that's exactly flow and pause media. In fact, flow and pause media and looking at traffic is absolutely right. And it also explains why this coefficient is low. Okay, you might say, well, if I'm driving down a straight road, you know, I can go at this speed and now try driving through London. Yeah, you go 100 metres and then there's a traffic light or some crossing or some roadworks or some something. You have to take a deviation and it all gets very complicated. Mm, just like flow and pause media. Right? So imagine yourself going through the pore space of a rock is going to be highly tortuous. So the permeability is not really just R squared. It's got this coefficient. So now what I'm going to do is I'll just give you some typical numbers just to give you some sense of scale for permeability, and particularly how much it varies uh, for different pores media. So let's now develop this concept of the relationship between permeability, porosity, and uh, typical throat radius. So this is not a rigorous equation, but it's sort of empirical, is that permeability is approximately, if you just want a, a sort of order of magnitude, 10 to the minus 2 times porosity times the square of, say, a throat radius, something that we're, you know, not the smallest throat radius, but basically the throat you have to get through to connect from one size to the next. So it's a bit like driving. You know, you're not looking at the very narrowest roads that don't take much traffic, but the road you have to get through to go across the city. OK, so let's think of some examples. OK, um, so here we're going to say what it is. So this is the porous medium. Phi, R and K. And we'll do this in, you know, strict SI units, of course. So um, let's think about a sand. So something maybe that you have with a pot plant, a sand and some organic material, obviously. So if you have a sand, typical porosities make can be as high as about 40%. The radius, well, you can have grains of sand that may be about a millimetre across. So you can, if you have, you know, reasonably, reasonably coarse sand, something, and this is going to be metres, this is metres squared, okay, and this is a dimensionless number. So now let's look at this. This is roughly R squared is 10 to the minus 6, 7, 8. So this is about 4 times 10 to the minus 8. Okay? And that's in terms of meter squared. When we go deeper underground, we see sandstones and carbonates. These are consolidated rocks in the deep subsurface. These are the rocks that typically, you know, contain conventional oil and gas from which we, we extract hydrocarbons, but also potentially stores for carbon dioxide or even hydrogen. Here we tend to have porosities that are lower, typically in the range from 10 to 30 percent. Typical pore radii, well what was that typical pore radius we were talking about before? About 10, 10 microns. Okay, so if we do this, this is 10 to the minus 10, 11, 12. So it's 2 times 10 to the minus 30. And typically, for reservoir rocks, that, as I said, we may be storing CO2 or producing oil and gas, are normally in the range of about 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 15, okay, in terms of square metres. But we can have less permeable materials. What about clay? Clay actually has a quite complex laminated structure where although the porosity can be very high, about 50%, actually the uh, flow is restricted to very small pores. So the radius here may be of order 10 to the minus um, 7, so a tenth of a micron. So if we do this again, 10 to the minus 14, 15, 16, so 5 times 10 to the minus 17. And then shale. Shale is essentially fine-grained sediment. It's some shale is also the source rock for oil and gas. 
is where the kerogen breaks down into oil and gas and then that migrates uh, to make a conventional oil field. Uh, there's lots of deposits of shale that don't necessarily have any oil and gas. And obviously one of the revolutions in, um, sorry, the revolution in certainly US oil and gas production has actually been to, to fracture the shale from which the oil and gas can be produced. But the shale itself can sometimes have very low porosities. 1% or just a few percent. The radius of the pores in the shale are on the nanometer scale, say 10 nanometers, which is 10 to the minus 8 in terms of, of uh, meters. So if we do this, R squared 10 to the minus 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we're looking at something like 10 to the minus 20 square meters. Now, the problem with this, and of course this is one problem with SI units, is that they're all very small numbers. It's 10 to the minus something. And that's sometimes not terribly intuitive. So what we do have instead is the unit of a Darcy, named after Darcy, of course. Now, the problem with the unit of a Darcy is that it was first introduced in the 1930s. And it was first introduced actually by um, a, a, a number of reservoir engineers who first of all took rock samples from producing reservoirs and measured their flow potential. And they defined the Darcy so that if you had a piece of rock that was one centimetre on all sides, and if you had a pressure difference across the rock of one bar, then if the permeability was one Darcy, the flow rate would be one cubic centimetre a second. Now, the fact of the use of centimetres is okay. It's the flow of water that approximately has a viscosity of 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds, um, and one bar is approximately 10 to the 5 pascal. So it's sort of, sort of, SI, but not quite. If you go through the maths, one Darcy is approximately 10 to the minus 12 square metres. Now, if you ask me, we should just define the Darcy to be exactly 10 to the minus 12 uh, square metres and be done with it. But if you Google it, it's not quite, it's 9.8 something times 10 to the minus 13 square metres because of this definition, you know, from almost 100 years ago. Come on, guys, time for us as a porous medium community to sort of move vaguely somewhere into the 20th century. I'm not saying, you know, cutting edge here. But um, so we can look at K in terms of Darcy's. Okay, and that's traditionally how we do it because it's much more intuitive. I wouldn't worry about the conversion. I'm just going to do this 10 to minus 12, largely because experimental measurements of permeability are not that precise. But if we have 10 to the minus 9, that's a thousand Darcy's. So this is sands can be up to thousands of Darcy's. Okay, sandstones and carbonates are basically for one milli Darcy, so 10 to the minus 3 times, so that's 10 to the 15 to about one dose. This is typically what you see with reservoir rocks. But now if we're going down 10 to the minus 15, this is 10 to the minus 18 is now not a milli Darcy, but a micro Darcy. Okay, so we got 550 micro Darcy's here. Okay, and then if we go down even further, right, if we have a nano Darcy, that's 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 90, sorry, 9 is 10 to the minus 21. Sorry, let's do my addition or my subtraction, right? If we have a nano Darcy, that's 10 to the minus, so this is, say, 10 nano Darcy's. So when we're looking, just to give you sort of a sense of perspective, when we're looking at sands and soils, things that are relatively shallow in the subsurface, we're looking at thousands of Darcy's to a few tens of Darcy's. When we get deeper underground, sort of about a kilometre depth or more, we have consolidated rock. And certainly the conventional oil and gas fields, as I said, where we're going to use for storage and extraction are normally in the range of a milli Darcy to a Darcy. When we get to clays and shales, we can get down to you know, almost the nano Darcy type range. Now, the reason why I've mentioned all of this is traditionally, certainly in hydrology, has been this idea that you have something that's permeable, that allows flow, and something that isn't permeable, a sort of categorization, you know, into a yes or no box. And that actually can be very harmful 
certainly in terms of how you think. So shale, for instance, shale was defined as impermeable. Well, it's not impermeable, it's very low permeability. But if you say it's impermeable and you work for a major oil company, you're not going to drill in shale because there will be grey hair guys like me. I've been working in this subject for 30 years and I'm telling you it's impermeable, so don't waste your money. So in fact, the first discovery of shale was actually from a small independent company that had no other option but to try and have a horizontal well, fracture the shale and allow there to be flood. So something that was considered impermeable once you fracture it allowed sufficient flow to economic production. So don't over categorize. The other thing I'm going to say here is look at this variation. So even if you were looking at a body of rock, okay, say it's a sandstone with some clay, you have variations in permeability over many, many, many orders of magnitude. Okay, so here we're looking at um, 10 to the minus 17 to 10 to the minus 12, say. So it's about five orders of magnitude. If you've got a layer of shale, we're looking at, you know, potentially, you know, eight or more orders of magnitude. So permeability is a highly variable object. So you will see within the same body of rock, you know, some shale or clay and then some sand, and that permeability varies hugely. And that means that the flow is highly heterogeneous. So it's heterogeneous at the pore scale, going through complex pore space, and it's heterogene heterogeneous on all scales upwards simply because of this extreme variation with radius. Okay. The final concept I'm going to introduce in um, this video is a scaling of capillary pressure. And that seems to be sort of sounds a bit bizarre, um, but it is actually related to this expression. And it's the Leverett J function. So what I'm going to do is actually draw here a primary drainage capillary pressure. But I'm going to do it in dimensionalist form. So let me show you what I've done. So I'll write it down here. The Leverett J function. So the capillary pressure clearly varies with pore radius, doesn't it? So if you think about a single capillary pressure, we talked about, say, if it's uh, if it's during drainage, you'd say, well, the capillary pressure is 2 sigma cos theta over R. But R, what's the radius of a pore throat? Well, as I said, with three-dimensional X-ray imaging, maybe we can find this and we can model it. But if you're just, you know, faced with a piece of rock, the easy thing to do is to measure permeability. You basically put a pressure difference across, then you measure the flow rate. So how do we relate radius we're not interested in this constant. Let the constants deal with themselves later. I can write instead of radius, at least scales as, right, has the same scaling as root k over phi. Okay, just look at that. Oh, what about, isn't there a point one? Yeah, well, this is sort of approximately hand waving. This is just getting the right relation, right? So if I double porosity or double permeability. So the concept behind the lever J function is as follows. It says, we're going to write the capillary pressure here, PC, in dimensionless form. And we know it's going to be related to a typical pore radius. So we put this out here, and it's familiar with 1 over radius, so it goes phi over k. And there's a sigma. And then what's left is a dimensionless function. So what it says is this is a typical pore radius. Obviously, it does depend, you know, as I, as I change saturation, I'm filling larger and then smaller pores. Sometimes there's also a cos theta term. This is often assumed to be one for drainage. And the reason why I'm putting it in a different color is that if we were to do this J function scaling for uh, water flooding processes, right, putting a cos, you know, there's a very, you know, it's mixed wet. What, what am I going to choose? All right, and then what happens if I say the average is 90 and it's got a zero here? So um, the leverage J function scaling normally actually doesn't even have the cos theta. If you do put it in, um, often often you're just assuming it's one, certainly for drainage. So when you do this, and I'm not going to go 
you know, bore you with too many of the numbers. But what you find is that if you plot it here, J of S1, okay, you have the same shaped curve as you would before. Right? So just like the primary drainage I've shown before, there's nothing, you know, don't agonize about the shape. You've got this J entry. But the nice thing is you get something that is of order one. And that typically most of the displacement, certainly in the larger pores that govern permeability, is over by a value of one. And the J entry is normally somewhere in the range of 0.2 to 0.4. So when you plot this in dimensionless pores, certainly if you've got a relatively, say, homogeneous rock, you have an entry pressure that's below one. By one, you haven't necessarily displaced everything, but you've displaced actually the majority of the pore space that contributes to flux. There are more complexities if you have lots of small pores, but generally speaking, this is a nice dimensionless way of representing the capillary pressure. And the reason why that's very useful is that if I have a measurement on a piece of rock with a given porosity and permeability, but I want to predict the capillary pressure for a structurally similar rock, but maybe with a different porosity and permeability, I can assume that the J function is the same and then use this scaling to calculate what the capillary pressure should be. So now we've introduced permeability, we've introduced capillary pressure. What we really need to do is to think about fluid flow and particular, and this is the main emphasis of these videos, fluid flow when you have multiple phases in the pore space. And that's what's coming up next. Cut.